Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hello. Okay, I was like, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Okay, I can see you and you're coming in clear, Craig. Oh. Cool. Craig, are you comfortable sharing your own slides or do you want us to share them? Yeah, I can share them. Okay. When sweet. you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll kick it off. Camille, she should be joining soon. She'll do some intro stuff and then floor is yours. Awesome. Is anyone on the line? Uh Dealing with the atmospheric river right now. Oh, west. Getting I'm dumped on. Sure. I'm a yeah. east coast. <laughs> Craig, where yeah, are you located? Uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So we're, yeah, we're getting some of the rain, all the cloud cover. But we don't have power outages like all of Seattle has right now. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. And fast too. Happened real quick. Yeah. Did you guys get a notification that the meeting was recording? When you did, yeah, you did. Okay, I think we set up so it's automatically recording. I just I don't know if I X out of it or if I just missed it. Yeah, so be careful already. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Camille. Hey. Alrighty. Number. Neil and Katie, I got it to work this one. I don't know what the heck was going on with the other meeting. It said I was um, not registered or something. Uh, not okay. administrative. It was I kept getting yeah, I kept getting error updates. So I apologize. No worries. We were only on for a couple minutes anyway. Yeah. I'm glad you were able to join this one though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm traveling right now. Um, so I'm gonna be cameraed off. But hello, Craig. How are you doing? Thank you for joining today. We're very excited. Yeah, I'm doing good. Real good. It's it's one of my uh, work from home days this week, so like, it's nice. I That's couldn't nice. imagine Where giving this in my cubicle. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like trying to think, like, what conference room has the best background? I was like, oh no, wait. <laughs> Don't have to do now that. Now we have the uh, adventure weights background inspiring. Yes. So. Yeah, that's my wife's doing. She's. <laughs> oh sure. It's it's always an adventure, right? Any teams meeting, any any work meeting, really. It's like, okay, what's coming up now? Very true. 
So a little bit of an icebreaker, but what is your guys' favorite Thanksgiving side dish? Ooh. Stuffing. I don't even have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's got wild rice in it, stuffing for sure. I'm from Minnesota and that's kind of a staple. This but I don't so... know, you can't beat a good like gravy soaked plate. I don't know. Like I think the <laughs> gravy alone is my favorite side dish. For me it's definitely the gravy and gluten-free rolls. That every time just if that's it, it's a complete meal. But I <laughs> never had stuffing growing up cuz my dad does not like stuffing at all. So we never had it for Thanksgiving. <sighs> It's funny, wow. we were sat Stuff, in our office Thanksgiving the today. Yeah. <laughs> Camille, you can use gluten-free stuffing mix. It's uh, pretty good. I would uh, recommend you try try it, you know. Well, not, I'm not having too late things, to start. Yeah, I'm having Thanksgiving with my in-laws, and they already let me know that they got a gluten-free stuffing packet, and they're excited for me to try it. So this is the year. <laughs> Right, and there's still a couple people trickling in, but we'll go ahead and get the meeting started. Um, quick note, we are recording this meeting and it will be posted on our OpEx video library, or NHA's OpEx video library. I'm Camille Ellsworth, I'm the chair of NHA's Flow, um, which is an amazing committee. If you don't know a lot about it, I definitely reach out to anyone who, who's part of the NHA leadership and we'll give you the rundown and, and make sure you you have everything needed to to join us um i am a project manager with r plus energies a renewable energies developer and we do pump storage hydropower and on this call today are katie and norbert who are my co-chairs so we'll go ahead and have katie and norbert introduce themselves as well Sure. So I'm Katie Rain. I'm a regulatory specialist with HGR. I sit in the Portland, Maine office, and I really focus on hydropower relicensing. Norbert, over to you. Perfect. Hey, everybody. I'm Norbert Woodhams with Worthington Products. Uh, we specialize in waterway barriers for debris control, public safety, and fish guidance. And, uh, really looking forward to the call today. That's pretty much all I have. Thank you guys. Um, so we're going to take care of a couple of housekeeping items before we really jump into today's content. Um, in terms of upcoming events, we do have Water Power Week that is just around the corner. I can't believe we're almost at the end of 2024 mm -hmm. and talking about 2025 events. Mm -hmm. But Water Power Week is March 31st to April 2nd in Washington, D.C. We will be having a flow networking event there and are currently working on securing a venue. So more details to come there. In terms of upcoming flow meetings, our December meeting is scheduled for December 19th and the tentative topic for the meeting will be about hydro operations in the winter time. For the December meeting, we are also planning to have a small competition to round out 2024. So stay tuned some more for some more details on that. We also want to highlight an industry resource that is available to you. NHA's Hydropower Systems Principles two-day virtual eight-hour course is accepting enrollment for the 40-hour course in 2025. And there, oh, I skipped some details there. So, there is a principal's course that is a two day virtual eight hour course that is accepting enrollment and that course will be held December 5th to 6th. And there is another course in 2025 that is 40 hours, so an expanded version of that two day course. For more information and details about the course, contact NHA's Joseph Lasso or Chris Hayes and we can drop that information into the chat for you. 
And finally, um, please keep your microphone muted during today's presentation as this is being recorded. And we want to ensure that the playback is as smooth as possible. So feel free to put questions into the chat or save them until the end of the presentation. When we get to the Q&A portion of the meeting, we would love it if you turned on your camera and mic um, for that section once Craig has finished his presentation. And with that, we are diving into an essential topic for energy professionals today, which is asset management. Understanding how to effectively manage and optimize assets is critical for the sustainability and growth of hydropower operations. We were very fortunate to have Craig Borsa here. Uh, he is the Senior Asset Management and Compliance Engineer with Avista Utilities and he's joining us to share his insights. Also wanna note that he's the vice chair of the operations and maintenance asset owner round table for the NHA. So he's really a, an asset to the NHA and Avista in general. We're again, so grateful to have him here and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Craig, the floor is yours. Thanks for the intro, Camille. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Craig Borsa. Uh, uh, you got my last name right, Camille. Nice job. Uh, got to give you a coffee card for that. Um, most people don't. Um, yeah, I am a asset management and compliance engineer. So it's interesting you noted the, the cold weather preparedness. I do uh, all of Avista's cold weather compliance. Um, work as well um, and uh, work in asset management, which yeah, we'll dive into. I've got a couple of case studies we're gonna run through. Um, asset management topic is is pretty in depth. It's, you know, it's all about optimizing your resources for, um, for like economic value, uh, making sure, you know, you're, you can run when you're asked to and, uh, you know, replacing components, uh, doing doing the minimum amount of maintenance you need to uh, to maintain your reliability. So, um, but yeah, I'll start with a little background. Um, so I work for Avista Utilities. Um, we're located in Eastern Washington State. We have service territory in um, Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington. And then we have a lot of gas service in Oregon, um, Washington, and Northern Idaho. And we have a, a little bit of generation over in Montana as well. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my engineering progression. Um, and, uh, you know, please stop me along the way if anything resonates with you, if you have any questions or whatnot. Uh, I've got a lot of cool pictures. And we'll go through some asset management case studies for generator step up transformers and talk about some trends that we're looking at um, or um, you know our the o m um, asset owner group is looking into um, maybe pique your guys's interest on those um, if you work for a, a utility we collaborate on on yeah asset management maintenance items um, operational items etc um through the the amazing uh nha um uh o m asset owner group so um so yeah i uh i went to the university of minnesota duluth i am a millennial i'm at the very like i'm like the i don't know one of the um there's like a netflix comedian that talks about being an elder millennial i feel like i i'm there I'm kind of at the cusp of gen x and millennial um, but I do really appreciate my work from home days like today. Um, so yeah, I uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota Duluth, uh, right out of college. I got uh, a really cool opportunity to work for a startup company trying to build a coal gasification um, power plant in northern Minnesota. We did a lot of permitting, a lot of engineering work. We didn't ever break construction. Um, so I leveraged that opportunity to work at the ConocoPhillips um, Wabash River plant, uh, which was a coal gasification plant. So it's essentially you take, I know this is a hydropower group, but 
uh, bear with me for a sec. It's a really cool technology that I thought would take off and it still could, but you take coal or like the waste products from petroleum refining, you turn it, you put it in this gasification chamber and it basically turns into a natural gas. And so it's a pressurized volume of gas that you have to clean up. So it's a lot easier to clean it up than like a conventional coal plant. Um, but you take the synthetic gas, you clean it up, you remove the sulfur, you remo remove the mercury, um, and then you uh, can also remove the carbon dioxide from it uh, before firing it in a gas turbine. Um, so that was kind of my intro to um, to power generation. And then I guess, yeah, you also recover steam and run a steam turbine. So after a few years uh, working in, um, Coal gasification, I uh, moved out west, um, followed one of my brothers who lived in northern Idaho. So I moved to southern Idaho, uh, worked for Idaho Power Company for five years. And kind of right out the gate, I, uh, they, you know, I was a mechanical engineer. And uh, one of the things they asked me to do was um, get into air permitting and do some air permitting for their um, their natural gas plants. Since I'd done some permitting in the past, you know, I leveraged that uh, knowledge to help help their team and then soon became uh, the lead engineer. Um, and then, yeah, helped with construction of a new natural gas plant and then really got into a lot of hydro plant work, um, doing rehab projects like replacing wicket gates and turbines on a couple of their uh, plants and doing a lot of maintenance. I really liked the hydro. So um, after five years at Idaho Power, I moved to Avista and really wanted to focus on hydropower. So um, I've done a lot of spillgate and headgate work, um, replaced um, or rebuilt most of our gates. We've had a lot of problems with bushings. We've switched to like the greaseless bearings and um, the tolerances we specified when we replaced them originally uh, were too tight or they swelled because of uh, the water um, would cause them to swell or um, thermal, you know, um, thermal expansion. Anyway, uh, we had had to go through and rebuild a bunch of our gates. Um, so I took the lead on that. I uh, did a lot of bearing work here. This is a picture of a wooden bearing that we replaced. Um, is, this is a material called lignum vita. It's it, we have a lot of old hydro plants out of Vista, and it, it's really cool because you get to see all the history. This bearing was probably put in. It could have been original, like um, around 1916, and it's a wooden thrust bearing on the top of a runner. And uh, we had one critical mistake in this project. Um, we were painting the, the inside of the penstock. So it was like a two month outage. And these bearings, this wood needs to stay wet, but we, we forgot to leave the water on it. And it dried up this bearing, it became very brittle and it basically disintegrated once we started running again. So my job was to go in, identify what was going on, why we were having thrust problems. And then we replaced this with composite material. Um, other things I did like, yeah, a lot of vibration work, um, dam safety inspections. This is a head cover. We monitored the crack. Um, we noticed our maintenance crew noticed a crack on, this is like a boss to, um, the wicket gates. This is the wicket gate stem and this is the head cover. So we noticed a crack here and I spent several years following the crack, measuring it. Um, watching it move and then we finally were like, okay, we better stop drill it. So um, just kind of a good picture. And I got into some concrete projects and, you know, this is kind of like the, the way my career has gone is just kind of um, getting, you know, pushing my limits. I really like pushing my limits of knowledge. I'm a mechanical engineer, but we got to do, I got to do some concrete grouting where you basically drill holes through the dam, like a two inch hole, and then you inject um, pressurized grout to stop cracks in the concrete. Um, so we, the intent of this project was to stop all the water from traveling through this narrow arch dam. And then the next year was to um, 
demo the concrete and rebuild the concrete on the face. Um, we couldn't do couldn't rebuild it without stopping the water. So, um, but yeah, just in my career, I've just found that it, it it's so much more fun to do challenging new projects. This is a bridge deck we rebuilt. Um, uh, concrete bridge deck. Here's another uh, a, a big arch bridge. Here's a better photo of it. This is my favorite project I've done. Was this is this bridge was built in like 1922, and had never been worked on. Um, but we uh, have a rehab project that's going on uh, in the next couple of years. We actually qualified for one of those grants um, that went around. Uh, the NHA helped. Um, I think it was a 237 grant that we got. But uh, you know, we wanted to make sure the bridge was was. Uh, ready and load rated for for the future rehab project. But I live right next to this thing, see it all the time. Um, really cool project. And then, yeah, I mentioned dam safety projects. So it's like if you ever notice water traveling around your your dam or downstream of it, this is a park downstream of one of our dams. And one year we just had a whole bunch of water show up. So it led, you know, uh, an investigation to look at the drawings, try to figure out where the water could be coming from. And it turned out it was like a drain. There's a drain that was, you know, designed in to the project in like 1995 and a root had grown into it and plugged the water um, or plugged the uh, the drain. So the water came up in the park one summer. So anyway, um, so that's a little history. A little my history. So after, you know, working on a lot of these projects, I got put onto a team um, to do an assessment of all of our plants and build an asset management program for Avista. So it's basically, um, you know, we spent four weeks, about a month, I guess, at each one of our hydro plants. We put a rating system to every piece of equipment. We did risk assessments. And then, uh, you know, since then, we've been updating the data slowly um, since 2018, but we've also been analyzing it. And so that's what I'm going to get into. This is a um, asset management plan for our generator step up transformers. And I'm not going to go through all the details. There's a lot that goes into these. Um, and I know we have a very, you know, um, large breadth of um, experience or, or job functions on this call. So I don't want to bore you with the ISO 5500, you know, language. So just kind of kind of walk through how we go through analysis. Um, so it really starts with looking at the failure mechanism. So for a generator step up transformer, there's several components to it. You have oil, an oil system. Usually you have coolers on it. Um, and so you look at like the failure mechanisms for that oil system. So you could have contamination or you could have a leak. Contamination could come from arcing going on inside of your, um, your windings. That arcing is a good indication that you're going to have a failure coming soon, right? So um, you also have bushings. A good way to test your bushings is... Um, you could have damaged bushings or, or dirt and moisture in them. The best way to test it is to put some, um, do a power factor test on it, put some current into it when it's isolated and, and test and look for leakage. So it's really going through each component of each, or each subcomponent of each um, asset at your plant and looking at how it can fail and then that should really feed into your operations and maintenance work. And so anything you do at your plant, you should be trying to mitigate some of these failure modes, right? So you do daily rounds, you look at oil levels to prevent, you know, uh, to check for oil leaks. You look at temperatures to see if you have a um, fault condition coming on or, um, you know, some instrumentation not working. So, um, you know, this it's for every asset class like generators, turbines, etc. We go through this process, and then we write a standard for the maintenance. And likely, your your plants or your clients will, uh, you know, have this um, as well. So 
we then do a risk assessment on our transformers. So this is a, a picture of a transformer. It's one of three single phase transformers. So each phase A, B, and C has their own dedicated transformer. And we look at, you know, the risks associated with environmental spills. So you have a bunch of oil, right? Um, you could have, I don't know, yeah. If there's that many other environmental things other than the oil, because it's full of oil. Um, you look at financial impacts associated with, um, you know, downtime if it were to fail, or you look for um, uh, financial impacts of maintenance, increased maintenance. Um, so let's walk through this one. Um, so so this again, we have three single phase transformers, and we don't have a spare for it. So. And the fact that we don't have a spare, if one of these were to have a fault, we'd have a, an oppor it'd be like a um, kind of an opportunity cost, I'd say, associated with uh, with an outage. So if this were to fail, it might take 18 months to replace it. So this 100 megawatt plant or unit at the plant would likely be down until we could get a replacement. So it might be a year and a half. So that's a lot of risk, right? So you quantify that risk and the probability that one of these were to fail. Um, it doesn't have a low side breaker. So we're kind of, this, this most plants will have a, uh, a generator breaker in between the generator and the transformer. Um, this is located in Montana and we get a lot of cold weather, right? So if we were to shut this, turbine off in the winter, we would be essentially shutting off the, the step up transformer and cooling it off. So every time we stop and start this, we would heat cycle this transformer. And so if we were to replace it, we'd have a huge opportunity gain, right? An economic gain associated with replacing it and having a new um, low side breaker. So, um, other things you look at, I mentioned environmental. You know, you could have oil leaks. A lot of this piping looks very corroded, right? Um, I will say that there aren't, um, there, there are no current oil leaks with it, because if, if it did, then the probability would be super high, right? Um, but currently we, we, we maintain it. Uh, any oil leak that would happen, would go to the station sump and we would clean it up. It don't, it wouldn't go straight to the river. So just got to say that right now. But in asset management, you look at all the what if scenarios, right? So what if there were an oil leak here? The probability looks like it could be kind of high due to all this corrosion on it. Um, so you assess that at a, you know the the consequence of having an oil leak that would make it through the sump and go out to the river. Um, so that could be maybe a $2 million cleanup effort, right? And then you assess the probability of that. Um, one problem, the biggest problem at this dam is we've got wet cracks through it, right? I mentioned the grouting program at one of our other dams. This one also has wet cracks. Most dams leak, right? Probably all dams leak to some extent. But in a freezing climate, this can build up ice on the downstream face of the dam and it could slide off and um, damage our coolers, cause an oil spill. So the probability again and the consequence would be somewhat high for us. So anyway, so we take all this data, this risk assessment. Um, you also look at safety events, but I've kind of spent quite a bit of time on that. So I'll jump, jump to the condition index. So, um, so we also do a condition assessment um, which there's a lot of, there's like three different assessments out there that I know of that, that you can look at. Um, and a lot of private companies also will, will do an assessment for you. So they'll give you like a ranking system. So you ask a bunch of questions. How is it, um, how has it been operating? Do you have a bunch of outage time with it? That gives you a score, um, you know, uh, do you have a lot of maintenance associated with this? Do you have a lot of um, physical inspection? Do you have oil leaks currently? Do you have any 
um, any signs that you have um, a failure coming on on this transformer. So that gives you a rating system. And so on the y-axis here, you get a score from zero to 10 for your asset. Um, this transformer in question is pretty good. It's rated an eight. This is the trend line. We expect all transformers to follow until they're failed. Some obviously are underperforming like these ones here that I'm circling. Or the one we're talking about, it's overperforming. It's doing, this condition's actually pretty good. Um, it's 46 years old, so, um, and the score is about eight. So that's pretty good. Um, and then we take all this information, the risk assessment, the condition assessment, the kind of the life cycle assessment um, of what all transformers and the population of transformers, um, what the characteristic life is, and we can create a curve like this for our all for this transformer. So there's a lot here. I'll kind of walk you through it. But this blue line here is the um, the annualized replacement, like capital cost. So this would be our future transformer cost depreciated over its life. So we've got years on the bottom scale and cost on the vertical scale, and um, it's just your depreciation cost of your new replacement asset. Then we add in this risk cost. So this is that risk evaluation for environmental, financial, um, and safety. So it's the cost, uh, the consequence cost times the probability times the probability it would happen. So um, we then also plot our annual maintenance cost. And then any major um, maintenance work, like maybe we replace our bushings every 10 years or 15 years or something, depending on what your, um, you know, your failure modes and effects analysis gets at. So you plot all four of these lines and you get the green bars. So the green bar is your total life cycle cost for that year. So you can kind of see this is a good bathtub curve. And there's a great economic minimum for when we should replace this asset. So at around 43 years, we should replace this. Um, and then we got plus or minus 2% of cost here. So it kind of gives you a good range of when your company should target replacing this transformer. So that's um, one side of the case study. So I have another transformer I wanted to walk you through here too. Um, this transformer is, um, we have four transformers at this plant. They're uh, vertical, the turbines are vertical um, camelback turbines. So there's two turbines connected to one generator. The turbines um, are connected to a sing the same shaft the generator is. So they spin at the same speed and they oppose each other. So the water comes into each scroll case and then goes out through the same draft tube. So the, the beauty of this arrangement, this was like a 1910 to maybe 1920 design, but the beauty of this was that the both of the turbines, the thrust um, opposed each other. So it kind of balanced out the, uh, the, uh, the need for a, a thrust bearing. So they were able to have, you know, um, smaller thrust bearings. So the generators for this plant are all located inside. The, the building. It's amazing to have this much space, to have this big of a powerhouse. They don't, they don't build them this, this good anymore. But so for this transformer, you do the same assessment. You look for oil leaks. Well, I've got this amazing oil containment here, right? Um, that'll hold the whole volume of the transformer. So the potential for an oil leak is very low. Um, consequence would be about the same, but the probability is almost zero. Uh, you look at your test data, um, or well, I guess, um, no, I'm jumping ahead. This is risk cost. So uh, financial impact. So we do have a spare at this plant. So we do have four plus one spare and a cooler, uh, spare cooler. So the financial impact would be lower. It's also a lot smaller generator. These are 20 megawatts versus the last one was 120. So the outage time for this is much less. So, you know, the, the risk 
Uh, the biggest risk is a safety risk. We have a control room located right above this transformer. So um, that that's kind of the driving factor for replacing these, as we found. So then we look at, uh, so we do our condition assessment. So this is the last one we were looking at up here, right? Um, these four transformers at this plant are uh, circled. And we're going to talk in particular about this one in the middle. It's like rated a like a 3.5 maybe. Um, so this is um, the one to note I'll be talking about in the next couple of slides. But so we put all this information together, condition assessment, the risk assessment, and this is our life cycle curve. Nowhere near as pretty as the last one, right? There's no economic point that it's economically viable to replace this transformer between 52 years and 80. So why don't you replace it at 80, right? It's basically run to failure is what we, um, when we look at this graph, we run them to failure. So that's what we need to drive our maintenance to. So you really, um, you know, as you get to these outer years, we'll, we'll increase our maintenance cycle um, for oil sampling or, um, you know, power factor testing to determine if it's failing. And hopefully we'll have a bit of an indication for a few years before it fails. But the reality isn't quite the same, right? So in 2015, we decided to replace these four transformers and the spare. Um, so we requested the budget. What's the reality of, uh, of all projects? It takes a couple of years to get the budget. Uh, approved, right? You have so much other work going on, you can't just replace it right away. So it took 2017, we finally started the project. In 2018, we hired the owners, uh, an owner's engineer to, to investigate um, the project and determine the right transformers to put in. We, were, we looked at changing the voltage. These are really low voltage. It's like 4, 4260 volts, I think, for the generator voltage. Um, so we ended up changing the rating to, I think, 6.9 kV. Uh, so 2019, we determined what transformers, to, what size to get. We then put an RFP out and in 2022, so three years later, we finally got a contract executed to replace them. So that was October 2022. And in November, the next month, we had a failure of number four. Um, it was gassing, a power factor showed, it was uh, failing, so we installed a spare. And these things won't actually get replaced until 2026. So it's 10 years, takes 10 years to replace it. So for a run to failure asset, you gotta, you know, we're, we're trying to identify failure 10 years in advance. And that's really where the science of asset management comes in. It's figuring out, you know, this, this one in the middle is the one that failed. Well, it wasn't the worst at the time, right? Um, but it it slowly crept up. So um, it's yeah, it's it's so this is us moving the spare out onto this hundred year old rail cart, which we had to refurbish first, right? Um, but we guys swapped it out. It's operating today, and you know we still got two years until uh, the new ones will be energized. So. Uh, but yeah, this is where we requested the budget and then it started gassing a lot. We started doing monthly samples and um, then we changed the oil and um, just to see, you know, make sure uh, we were able to read um, how much it was gassing and then it spiked up again the next uh, week, I think. So yeah, that's that's when we determined it finally failed. But anyway um so how do we do a lot of this asset management so we've built work orders into maximo for our condition assessments we've put in tons of data we've programmed into maximo and uh and then we're using tableau to visualize it so we've got all these cool visualizations tons of tons of data there um and it's you know we've i showed you the report so that report for the transformer analysis alone is like 60 pages long we can't get anyone to read it, right? Um, so I've created a podcast series to kind of break down 
all of the data, look at each plant so that we can get peer review. So I can, you know, we can give them a 60 page document to review or I can put together a 15 minute video and walk through like, hey, here's all the Long Lake data. Uh, so the plant guys, anyone working on a project there can give us feedback really quickly on on our analysis. Um, so yeah, the podcast has been super fun. Um, so yeah, some emerging trends that we're working on with other utilities uh, in part through that uh, O&M um, operators forum are trying to recover costs for ancillary services. So we're ramping our units a lot more than we used to and making a lot of money. We're in the, the Cal ISO um, EIM, so we're, we're ramping our units a lot more. Um, and so we've created this tracking system in uh, PI, the plant information system. So I've, I've worked with our designers and we've created these codes to to crunch out, to look at voltages and breaker status and such. And we're able to determine like if we have a fast ramp event going on. If you have a fast ramp event, that'll affect your um, your, your generator uh, more than a slow ramp event, right? So um, you'll go through a lot higher heat cycles, maybe a transformer too, if you don't have a um, low side breaker. So, you know, it's trying to recover costs associated with some of these operating zones like if you're operating in the rough zone so we're counting hours we're in there and trying to determine ways to recover the cost for dispatching our unit in here um so this is one area um you know i think the industry is working pretty hard on um and uh you know we'd like to have more more folks participate with us on Another one is uh, AI driven decision making. We hear AI for everything, right? I used AI to create this picture and it's pretty good. Um, I asked for a hydro plant. It, I don't know what this is, if this is a pen stock on a spillway or if this is our generating unit. I don't know, I don't get it. But uh, I think AI has, we have a lot to gain from AI um, looking at like our plant data, the stuff we don't normally look at every day. Um, if we can get, triggers or alarms on those things. I know a lot of folks um, like the Hydropower Research Institute and um, you know some of the uh, the larger companies uh, are, are are doing more with AI and their plant data. Um, this is one area that really excites me. Um, you know this is a vibration monitoring graph. Um, we look at our vibration data every quarter maybe. Uh, it'd be nice to have a tool that looks at it all the time and can flag things. And the last trend I've seen I've seen is um, you know continued attrition and training. Um, you know these are some of my favorite folks that have all retired from Avista. Um, you know the first ten years of my career was you know learning from these folks and uh, um, absorbing their knowledge, and they've all retired. And now we're seeing, you know, a lot of job hopping, like uh, younger engineers, project managers, it'll work, you know, for three years or so and then move to another job. Um, so we're constantly doing a lot of training. So, um, yeah, you got, there was a, a note on the Hydropower Academy um, that NHA is um, putting on in, I think it's December 4th and 5th. There's a, a training session. I'd highly recommend it. Um, heard really good feedback on it. I'm on um, part of the peer review committee for a couple of the tracks, the asset management one. Um, but I'd recommend this to your colleagues, to you know anyone new to hydropower, um, or as new new people get hired, like yeah, definitely send them to it. Or new managers say someone's working in thermal plant, they want to, then they get switched to hydro. Um, this will really get you up to speed. So, um, yeah, just finding finding new ways to to transfer knowledge is uh, is a really big challenge. So, um, and then yeah, just know you know your career will evolve. Mine has significantly. Um, you know, I never thought going into mechanical engineering that I'd do air permitting, but I did that. You know, uh, took on the challenge at Idaho Power. And shoot, 
even last year at Avista, I was asked to help out with some air permit issues that we're having. And, uh, um, you know, leverage every opportunity you get because it, everything comes back around. Some At some point in your career, you'll do it again. So do the best you can and have fun along the way. I love working at, on hydro. It's nothing more amazing than uh, going and hanging out on the river, you know, watching the wildlife and stuff uh, while you're, you know, working off from a barge or whatnot. But uh, anyway, with that, uh, that's that's the last slide I have. So went through it pretty quick. I'm sure you got some questions. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Craig. Any questions? Hey, Craig, I might kick off a question and then we'll go to Luke really fast. Um, but I was curious with the work that um, you do, specifically with the life cycle cost analysis and the conditions analysis, I, do you ever compare it to what was modeled prior to commissioning? Like how accurate the the cost analysis or analysis projections forecasting was prior to commissioning? No, uh, we haven't yet. Um, our asset management work in generations only about six years old, five six years. Um, the first thing we're doing is checking, yeah, like the life cycle cost curve. Um, if I can go back to it here, like this curve here, um, you know, what we're finding these days. So in 2018, we created our data base, right? And we looked at capital replacement costs for a transformer. And we assumed that this transformer would cost like $2 million, I think. But with the recent increase in cost, um, with you know uh, after the pandemic steel costed so much more and everything so yeah we we need to go back and update our assumptions because likely these curves are shifting to the right right like this one this pretty one right here will probably be a little flatter because the capital cost curve will shift to the right so probably move this economic um optimum range to the right but we haven't gone through that exercise yet um just to um, just to true up our, our base assumptions, even without a project. But yeah, we that is definitely uh, one area. One of the biggest challenges with asset management, I'd say, is having good data. And that's a perfect example of, you know, you can never have too much data and never have it too quick. Uh, you want it yesterday, right? Yes, always. So. Yeah, great question. And Luke, I think you, you have your hand raised there. Yeah, um, hopefully I'm audible. Yes? Yep. Sweet. Uh, Craig, thanks for that. That was that was a really cool presentation. Um, I'm, I'm a plant engineer. I've been there for four years and I can't believe what they've uh, allowed me to touch. You know, I can, I can relate to your last slide there. Uh, you just have no idea where your career is gonna go. Um, and you kind of already hit it like data is the start and stop of asset management. If your data is poor, your forecasting is too, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I'm coming from a place where in comparison to a Vista, we're a scrappy hydro owner operator, even, even though it's a large facility where I work, um, we have no good data or trustworthy, it, that's not true. So, Our data has problems and we we are just so far from being able to asset manage the way that's being described here. Uh, it seems like most organizations in hydro are really thinking along the lines of, all right, let's do our inspections. Let's get our paperwork through so that when this thing fails and we don't know when that's gonna happen because we have no idea, the insurance company picks up the bill for us. <laughs> and I'm just curious to hear if, you know, in your arc with Avista or elsewhere, if you watch that change for your organization for the better, or if it's 
really this is reserved for utility scale organizations no not at all so i drove this change with one other um we have um rob gray as um he's he's been with the vista for 20 some years he has 40 plus years in the industry so him and i have built this uh the system for generation um, from the from nothing as well. So in five years, yeah, we've we've progressed to the point where yeah, we we think we're pretty sophisticated and we can use these tools to to try to weed out you know some of the projects that are nice to have versus the ones you really need. Um, and it has helped a lot of the conversation and focus focused the the work really to you know large capital cost projects that are on the powertrain or failing dam safety issues. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it doesn't take a lot of people to do this. It just takes, you know, um, a couple people. And that's really like, so I I run a, um, a call with several other asset managers at utilities every other month. Um, if anyone's you know interested, uh, I can add you to it. Um, if you have asset managers at your company, but um, we all really most of the companies in at least in Washington State only have like two people dedicated to this uh, each in each um, at each company for generation. They may have asset managers for T and D and such, but the analysis is different. That's all linear, based off of GIS data. Um, and like we've learned a lot through through the working groups, like the NHA group, the O&M asset owner group. Um, you know, we'll, all the other utilities are uh, we all help each other get better. And, you know, by having contacts like NHA, it's, it's really helped, you know, us, our small team advance so much faster because we now have peer reviewers that can actually do technical review on our assumptions. Right. So. Don't don't get discouraged. You guys can do it. Um, yeah, no, uh, that was some much needed help. Uh, but yeah, uh, if if that's available, getting getting to at least hear what organizations that are that are doing true asset management are succeeding with or are struggling with probably help us yep. and all kinds of other smaller groups get our feet off. Big time. Right yeah, direction. there's software yeah. tools you can buy that'll do this, but we we don't have the budget for that, right? So we do it with Excel. We did it with Excel first and then wrote like wrote it into our our CMMS software. Cool. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I I'm I'm envious. I, I miss my days as a plant engineer. Um it's yeah. It's fun Can fighting those fires, me, being the hero, right? Like, oh, <laughs> I actually found the, this pump. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, being the hero and the villain. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, Camille, I'll give it back to you. Hi. There we go. Just jumping back into my notes to make sure I don't miss any quick highlights. But thank you, Craig, so much for, for joining us on this call. Um, I know that you passed a lot 